Don't you think that God knew what was going on in King Darius' heart? I mean, read between the lines. This guy was, was so anxious, distressed about what was going on with this person who he knew loved God. Isn't it possible that Darius was truly concerned for Daniel and he was truly looking for the true God? And so what did King Darius do? He fasted. And after all, we see at the end, King Darius did become a believer of God. We see the proclamation. So is it really too much of a stretch for another reason why God intervened and protected Daniel is because someone prayed for Daniel. And it was this king, an unbeliever. God protected Daniel, I believe, in response to King Darius' prayer. King Darius was a seeker of God. He was a seeker of God. He was obviously a wise person. And he was trying to figure out what this uh, God thing was about because he kept Daniel by his side. And God gave him an opportunity to believe in God as he searched. The king knew in his heart that it was wrong to have Daniel killed. And so what did he do? He couldn't do anything else, but he called out to God. He prayed to God. I believe that's what happened. In verse 23, we note that the king was what? Was overjoyed. Do you remember when you first accepted the Lord Jesus Christ? How did you feel? I believe this is what we were seeing here. Not just because Daniel was saved, but because King Darius finally accepted and believed in the one and only true God. You know, the king could have been really upset that someone is greater than him. The king wasn't angry or upset, and he wasn't just happy. What do we note? He was joyful. He wasn't just joyful, he was overjoyed. He was super happy. He was like walking on air like he was in heaven. He was overjoyed. Why do you think he was overjoyed? One of the reasons is I just shared with you. The king was happy that Daniel was saved because he knew, first of all, that Daniel was a good man. Daniel did not deserve to be killed. He tried his best to try and save him. So when he was saved, he was overjoyed. But there's three more reasons. The king witnessed the power of God. And when you witness the power of God, I mean, we get excited when we see a great waterfall just crushing down, and we marvel. We see the beautiful skies, and we marvel at the creator God and here is the king experiencing the miraculous power of God. And thirdly, the king found out who the liars were. He found out who were the false accusers. And number four, as I shared, the king found the God he has been looking for. He became a believer. And because of the king's experience with God and believing he did three things, just quickly, number one, the false accusers were deservedly judged. They were the ones thrown into the lion's den. Number two, he truly believed in God, but not only that, he desired prosperity for every person in the world. Believe in this God. That's what is a result of true belief in God. That is the result of a true Christian who finally understood that you are saved by grace. Is you would look forward to sharing that wonderful news to other people. And you desire the best for them. You know, let me just throw that as I'm thinking about it. A lot of times when we're facing people, we don't even think about their eternal destination. We confront with them, with whatever situation. What we really need to do is see where they will spend eternity. That we would see them as Jesus sees them. People that are lost and that we would weep for them and desire prosperity for them to believe in Christ. Think about that. 
There are plenty of biblical principles for us today from this story. Let me briefly just highlight a few, and uh, sharing the word of God obviously is part of it. If we are followers of Jesus Christ, there will be persecution. This is a given because many in this world will not believe in Jesus Christ no matter what you do. They are just so stubborn, they refuse to believe in Jesus Christ as God and Savior. So when they confront someone who truly believes in Christ, they will try and harm you. They will persecute you. Persecution of Christians today can be as serious as being thrown in the lion's den to be devoured. Uh, perhaps in, in our situation that may not happen, but you know, when we started this church, when we started this church, there were times when I felt like I was in the lion's den. Not only have I just given it all to God right here or down my basement, because there were people that was persecuting the church and the belief that we have in Christ. As a young church, we need to be ready because there will be those that will not like and will go against what God is doing through you, either as a person or as a church. If we are true believers of Christ, we will be persecuted. So we need to know how are we going to handle it. We need to learn from Daniel. Daniel did three things. Three things we need to consider when we are being persecuted. Number one, and it's very important, am I really innocent in God's eyes? That's how Daniel dealt with persecution. That's how Jesus dealt with persecution. You've heard the term meekness. Meekness is power under control. When you know you're innocent, bring it on. The apostle Paul said, I can do all things through Christ. That didn't mean that he is a superman. He was saying, if you look at it in context, that I am saved by grace. Do whatever you want with me. I'm going to heaven. So, are you really innocent in God's eyes? Is your heart right? Have you given it to the cross and continually? If not, we need to go to the cross. We need to confess to God of our guilt, and we need to confess to those we've sinned, sinned against. We need to be innocent right down here. If God looks at your heart, is it clear? Is it been cleansed by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ? Do you really believe that? Because if not, persecution will continue. Number two, we are to trust God no matter what happens. Easier said than done. Trust God, let go, let God. E easier said than done. But may, may I just simply suggest this? When we don't trust in God, we are saying that God does not exist. Let me say that again. When we don't trust in God, we're really saying, well, God, I really don't believe in you. You really doesn't matter. And that is dangerous territory because it is the lie of the evil one. It is the lie of the devil to tell you that God is, does not exist or does not get involved in your life. So we are to trust God no matter what because we are to always remember this. When we don't trust God, we will be in dangerous territory. Trust is a must. Faith. We need to trust God. And as I alluded to with King Darius, uh, with his concern with Daniel, what we need to do is find people who will truly pray for you. Find people that you know are godly people and share with them your concerns, your persecution, and ask them to pray for you. I have a number of godly men, that, even one in Hawaii that I just contacted uh, yesterday to, to ask for prayers and, and praying for him as the tsunami uh, hit uh, Hawaii. But let me just share this real quickly. Did you notice that Daniel was alone in this situation? What happened to his buddy, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I find this interesting that Daniel was singled out all alone. What happened to the other believers? Daniel was the only one caught praying. What happened to his buddies? God has taught us from Daniel 1 to 5 how important it is to have faith partners. But here in Daniel 6, God is telling us that there may be times, there may be times that it seems like 
you're all alone in a den. There will be those times. But take heart, you're never alone. God will call on someone else to pray for you. Yes, it's important to have faithful friends and partners that you can call on, but never uh, accept the fact that you are taking it all by yourself. First of all, if you're a believer of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit within you. You have Jesus Christ praying for you all the time. He is our mediator. God is telling us there may be times when it may seem like we're all alone in our troubles, but we need to remember that we're never alone. God is there. His angels are there. His angels are right here, right now. And there will be people, and you may not know it, and I'm always praising God when I find out that God, that God has called on certain people to be praying. I know people, there are people that we don't even know are praying for this church. No matter our situation, no matter your situation, know that God is there with all his power and might. And yes, seek out people who will pray for you. The other biblical principles we need to know is what the king did in the situation, like I shared. Let me close with this. When we are distressed for someone, we need to follow the example of King Darius. Are you distressed about what's going on in our government or for something else? or for a person that's going through trials, may I suggest four things that King Darius did. Number one, are we really truly concerned for those people? And are we really placing our trust in God for them? Are we concerned and are we placing their lives and their faith in God's hands? What are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Make it a habit to first of all love God always and then work on truly loving others, the best for the other person. Be concerned with people and place your trust in God for them. Number two, have you really prayed and not only prayed for the situation or for people? Try fasting. Uh, Holy Week, Lent, some people call it, and some people fast. May you consider that. Give up something. Fast and pray. But don't just do it, I'm fasting because I want to be holy. There, there's a purpose for fasting and praying. It's because you're concerned for something that you are relating to God. So fast and pray for those you are distressed for. Number three, desire the best for those you are concerned about. Again, as I touched on it earlier, we need to be specially, specially concerned about their eternal life. We need to be specially uh, concerned that they would believe in Jesus Christ. You know, the greatest thing you can, um, you can give to anyone, the greatest thing you can do for anyone is to help them be secured with their eternal life with God. And it's only through Jesus Christ. You know, we, we can provide support. We can even give shelter. We can do all of these things. For example, things going on in Japan. Our first reaction should be, may people turn to Jesus Christ. Because we can provide all sorts of things, but if they're not going to heaven, what's the use? Desire the best, and the best is security of eternal life in heaven with God through Jesus Christ. And then finally, number four, we need to trust God who will eventually judge those that deserve judgment. We want to be judgmental. We want to take care of business that they need to pay for what they're doing. We need to, yes, let God and let go. Trust God. Would you take a moment just to pray about these things that perhaps the Lord is honing in in your heart to truly grasp and commit to and live your life as a follower of Jesus Christ in spite of persecution. Take a moment to pray.